Good evening, councillors, and welcome to the meeting. And a warm welcome to our council meeting to those members of the public who are in attendance in the gallery and to those who may be watching us online. This meeting is being webcast, so please speak clearly into your microphones. Now, please remain standing while I invite my chaplain, the Reverend David Chester, to lead us in prayer. Just a moment of stillness before we pray. Lord, we pray for all government officials and especially for the members of this council. We pray for Geoffrey Watt, the Mayor, that he may conduct the affairs of this council with wisdom and true justice. For the party leaders and all members at this time when decisions have to be made. We pray that all will truly represent the needs of the people and work in harmony for the advancement of all men, women and children in this borough. Grant to all leaders of our nation and borough gifts of wisdom, justice and fortitude that they may conduct their affairs in accord in accordance with the will of God. May they strive to form bonds of unity within will and work for the common good and prosperity and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Please be seated. Councillors, you are asked to consider whether you have any disclosable pecuniary and or any other relevant interest in connection with any matters to be determined in this meeting, and if so, to declare it and state the nature of such interest. May I remind you that you should state the item number and title and the nature of the interest in question. Councillor Lizzie Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I declare an interest, please, um, as I'm a member of Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority, and it's one of the notices of motion for debate tonight. Councillor Paul Hayes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I declare a personal interest insofar as I'm a member of the Transport Committee of the Liverpool City Region? That's in relation to a notice of motion taking back control of our buses. Councillor Jeff Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I declare an interest, personal interest, on the same item by the nationwide dwindling employment. <laughs> Councillor Mary Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I declare an interest in item 9A by virtue of my employment with the NHS? Councillor Phil Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I declare an interest in connection with item 9A insofar as I'm a council nominated governor of the Cheshire Rural Partnership? Councillor Tony Norbury. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I declare an interest in item mine regarding my daughter works for the uh, NHS as a social worker? Councillor Sharon Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I declare an interest in item nine as I work for the NHS myself? Councillor Joe Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Declare an interest in item nine and regards to work for the NHS. Councillor Steve Fabs. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, by virtue of being a member of the Transport Committee for the City Government and the Mayor's Office, uh, on item 10, similar to all. Councillor Chris Mead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My interest is on this motion number 5, which is my fact that I'm a member of the Fire Department. Councillor Jerry Williams. Councillor Christina Musprat. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Declare personal interest on item <coughs> 9 daughters who both work in the health service. Councillor Phil Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I declare a uh, disposal pecuniary interest in the general item 12, motion 2, uh, as I am a member of CWU and received sponsorship from in the past? I'll leave that to you later. Councillor Chris Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 9A personal interest, I work for CWP. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jeanette Williamson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, I'll declare an interest in the notice of motion regarding universal credit as I am um, an employee of the Department of Work and Pensions. I will believe in a change during the debate. Okay. Councillor Stuart Whittingham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Attorney uh, Council 12, the uh, <coughs> Council of Officers, uh, the Council of Officers, 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 the Council of in relation to item 9, um, by virtue of my employment in the NHS. Councillor Brian Kenny. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's two items. First of all, agenda item 12, motion number 5. I'm a member of the Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority. And the other one, Mr. Mayor, uh, I need to declare disposable pecuniary interest on motion number 2, post office services, because of my involvement with the Communication Workers Union. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Councillor Ron Hammond. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Agenda item 10, with my amendment of news and travel. Thank you. Councillor Adrian Jones. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I suppose I should declare an interest because Councillor Chris Jones has worked for the NHS for some 40 years. But I don't get anything out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Jean Stegman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, declaring the interest in item 5 as a member of the Merseyside Fire Authority. Thank you. Councillor Moira McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in, in relation to their gender item 9, we've got daughter who works in the NHS. And Councillor Mike Sullivan. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. The same with me at item 9. My daughter works for the NHS. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item 2, Mayor's announcements. The following apologies have been received in advance of the meeting. Councillors Tom Anderson, David Burgess Joyce, David Mitchell. Are there any further apologies? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Cathy Hobson. Thank you. So at this point, may I welcome Councillor Jean Robinson to the Chamber. Uh, since our October meeting, the Mayoress and I have attended a further 85 engagements. Uh, among the highlights, it has been a particular honour to represent the borough at ceremonies commemorating the centenary of the armistice which brought to an end the Great War. Um, and particularly uh, locally events um, marking the centenary of the loss of the Birkenhead war poet, Wilfred Owen. Now, um, oh yes, and you will find on your desk a small badge, hashtag it's never okay which is in connection with the motion further down the agenda. Uh, um, I have had a request from Council, request from Councillor Moira McLaughlin and Phil Davis asking to make short statements to Council. So I call Councillor Moira McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Councillors, after a very careful consideration and with a great sadness, on October the 24th, I resigned my membership of the Labour Party. This was after 40 years of membership and 23 years as a Labour Councillor, but I've become convinced that the Labour Party in its present form is not the party that I joined and have served, and it no longer represents the values that I hold dear. Though I understood that the consequence of my resignation from the Labour Party would result in me no longer being a member of the Labour Group, I was clear in my resignation letter that I have not lost confidence in the leadership of the Labour Group or my former colleagues. I have the utmost respect and affection for all but a very small number of them and recognise that they genuinely are trying to do their best for the people of the world in the most difficult of circumstances. I have, though, no confidence that the Labour Party has the will or the means to resist the hard left takeover of the party here on world, which is now almost complete. For over two years, I and others have provided evidence of the Labour Party to the Labour Party at local, regional and national level of an organised takeover by the hard left. And so far, no action has been taken. The tactics used to achieve the takeover include bullying, harassment and vilification of those who oppose them. And this behaviour... Thank you, Mr Mayor. This behaviour has been ignored and tolerated, and by ignoring it, the party condoned it. All four constituency parties on Wirral are now controlled by the hard left, as is the local campaign forum. This is the committee which has the responsibility for assessing the suitability of prospective candidates for local government election and for overseeing the selection of those candidates. At the time of writing my resignation letter, I predicted that long-standing, hard-working, moderate councillors would be removed and replaced by others deemed more ideologically suitable or by those who have no ideology, but will simply do the bidding of the hard work. Of course, now my prediction has been borne out, and my ward colleague Chris Meaden and the group chief whip, Ron Abbey, have become victims of this. 
Chris, as all of us here know, has been a hard-working member of this council for almost 28 years. She lives in Rock Ferry, is well known and very highly respected, and she knows and understands her ward and her constituents and their problems thoroughly. She's been replaced by a former leader of this council, whose time as leader many of us will remember well, the chaos it brought to the borough. But it's typical of the arrogance of the hard left, they'll disregard the fact that an electorate is made up of individuals who shouldn't be taken for granted. They have removed an excellent local representative whose roots are in her ward and parachuted in someone who has no knowledge of the area and has shown no previous interest in it. Presumably, she's been brought in so she can take up her former role as leader in the luxury of one of the safest labour wards in the borough. Oh, yeah. It's disgraceful and it demonstrates contempt for the people of Rock Ferry. Rock Ferry needs more than an absentee. Than what you, uh, Be quiet. Rock Ferry deserves more than an absentee councillor, and Wirral certainly deserves more than a return to the 1980s. Apart from the removal of moderate councillors, the move is now underway to change the relationship between the party and those elected by their constituents to make decisions on their behalf, from one whereby the party is supportive and advisory to one whereby elected members become mere delegates, controlled by an unelected clique of party officials, driven by rigid ideology in their distorted version of democracy. My sincere hope is that at some time in the future, as happened in the 1980s and early 1990s, the party will find the strength to free itself of this blinkered, intolerant faction and will return to the broad church which, in the past, the Labour Party has been proud to be. But in the meantime, I cannot pretend that I believe that in its present form, the local Labour Party will serve the best interests of those people who have relied on it to work for them. So I will remain for the rest of my term of office as an independent Labour councillor, as my values haven't changed, and I will continue to try to serve the best interests of my constituents as I understand them to be, as I have been doing for the last 23 years. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. options 
to assist the shipyard uh, to protect its position in a global competitive market and in anticipation of work already committed to by the MOD, seek ways to secure jobs at the shipyard today, as well as protect future employment opportunities. The task force recognises the complexity of this situation, but is encouraged that all parties are acting in good faith. Mr Mayor, Camel Laird, as we know, is not only a major employer in Wirral, and an important company uh, locally, it's also strategically important business for the whole of the United Kingdom. Camel Heard has a workforce recognised for their skills and dedication and has a proud history of shipbuilding and engineering on this side of the Mersey. Mr Mayor, with hundreds of jobs and training opportunities for local residents and numerous local supply chain contracts with world businesses, <coughs> um, this, I'm sure this council will join with me in wishing uh, the task force um, uh, is successful in putting together a, a, an action plan and the work that takes place between the government, trade <coughs> unions, Camel Earth management and the, the various councils, uh, we need to do whatever we can to support the future of the shipyard and protect those vital jobs for this borough. And can I just finish by just adding my thanks, I know a number of members have uh, uh, supported the workforce on the, the picket line over the last couple of weeks. I'd just like to say my thanks to everybody who's, who's done that. But I think the, the key now is to come up with a credible, sustainable action plan that will give the, the, the yard a future going forward. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, on behalf of the Conservative Group, can I begin by welcoming Councillor Robinson to her seat? Uh, for Upton Ward, uh, look forward to working with you for the benefit of your residents and the wider borough. Uh, Mr Mayor, in terms of Councillor McLaughlin, uh, obviously I don't want to intrude on the dispute between the members of the Labour group, but I would say to Councillor McLaughlin, it often takes more goods to leave than it does to stay. Uh, and certainly as an independent member of this council, along with Councillor Sullivan, we will work with you equally as we will with Councillor Robinson for the benefit of people in this borough. Mr Mayor, if I can uh, finish by thanking the Leader of the Council for his statement on Camel Lairds, and also for the courtesy that he showed to you last week in involving me in the updates he was receiving from Camel Lairds, the trade unions and the government departments. Clearly, on behalf of the Conservative Group, and as the son of a fitter at Camel Lairds, we will stand ready to work with you uh, on that issue and to support the company in whatever they need to get from the MOD or the contractors to secure the future of the workforce, the skills and the apprentices. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Phil Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Taking those issues in turn, I too would like to welcome a new member of the Council and hope that the member finds it satisfying, enjoyable and rewarding. I believe that we will do so. For serving the public, there is no greater honour that we all have. On the issue of Councillor McLaughlin, we all respect the skills and knowledge that Councillor Moira McLaughlin has. And whatever situation Moira is in, we will always listen to her advice and benefit from our experience and hope it's received in the way that it ought to be. On the issue of nerves, Mr Mayor, thank you to the leader too for involving me in discussions last week. I have been here, and four members will say unfortunately, have been here so long that I remember the early 80s when Councillor Dave Jackson and Councillor Hale and myself went down to London. At that time, there was a threat to the Lairds yard, a threat to the whole site. <coughs> Some people wanted to develop it and turn it into housing with a view across the river. And we went to see a government minister and convinced the minister that Merseyside counted, Merseyside had values and that there was a place for shipbuilding and ship repairing in our community. Thankfully, things worked out the way that we hoped for. In terms of the current situation, then, some members will know that the gentleman who recently owned and ran theirs, Mr John Severett, uh, was a student pupil of Eastern Secondary School, now Southfield High School, and it's a tribute to his determination an education in this department that a gentleman can move from Eastern and become the head of a successful shipbuilding, ship repairing business. And whilst that business now has rather more connections with the Peel Group, I would hope that all the efforts that are being undertaken are successful. And if there are ways of securing and diversifying that business, <coughs> the skills can be applied to other issues, 
then I certainly look forward to that and wish the task force and all those working and involved in it the best for the future that we can. Thank you, Councillor Gilchrist. The next item is item 3, a procedural matter. Members will be aware of the new electronic voting system which was used at the last meeting. When using the new voting system, I will announce when the system is activated. Similarly, I will also announce when voting on a particular matter is closed. I do not have to remind members that they must be seated in their allocated positions to vote, and that proxy voting is also not allowed. As per our last meeting, in the instance of a recorded card vote being requested, the usual roll call of names will be accompanied by the activation and use of our new electronic vote recording system. Whilst announcing their voting choice, members will be required to press the appropriate voting button in front of them. Green is support for, red against, or white if abstaining. Voting choices will be displayed on the monitor screens in the form of a seating plan. At the conclusion of the vote, a summary screen will display the total votes cast and will list individual members' choices relating to the subject in question. If members are in agreement, we will be using this system for all votes of council this evening. This will require suspension of standing order 18. Do I have a mover and second? So moved, Mr. Moved by Councillor Phil Davis, seconded by Councillor George Davis. Will members please indicate their support with a show of hands? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that is unanimous. <laughs> item 4, the minutes. Turning to item 4, the minutes of the Council held on 15th of October 2018, contained within pages 1 to 30 of the Council agenda papers. Pages 1 to 30. I will move approval of each of these sets of minutes as a correct record. Do I have a second? Second, Thank you, Councillor Phil Davis. So now we have the electronic voting system coming into use. Electronic voting system now activated. Will members please cast their votes? Has everyone voted? Close the vote. And that is also unanimous. Thank you. Three minutes are signed. Item 5, Petitions. Are there any petitions which Council wish to present to the Council in accordance with Standing Order 21? Councillor Leslie Ray. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I have a petition from residents in Upton um, asking that the Council work with them and also the trustees of Upton Victory Hall to stop the demise of the building and to stop it from falling into further disrepair. Councillor Jerry Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a petition from um, 476, Mayor of West Rural, suggesting to cutting down the trees in Ashton Park indiscriminately and asking if the Council would cease doing that until further investigation of the matter has been happened. Has happened. Thank you. Councillor Wendy Clements. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I have a signature with 471 signatures asking the Council not to build on green field sites. Councillor Steve Fouts. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If you could uh, indulge me, the, the petition, the first one I want to move, and uh, the second one, is a, a very large petition. Um, everyone would be aware of the huge campaign that's gone forward on the Save Our Mind uh, Injuries Unit and our walk-in centres. Uh, this is one of a number of petitions, and it's currently reaching 18,135 and growing by the minute. But that is only part of the story, Mr. Mayor, in as much as Frank Field, the MP, has sent out a letter and had 2,000 responses uh, opposing these closures, and, and 15, uh, many of those have had comments associated with them. A petition from Defend Our NHS of 6,000, which has been working really hard. A petition from Walsy Labour, that's raised 3,300. And a petition from Eastern Labour, which has raised 1,400. So well over 30,000 uh, in name and grown by the minute. And we wish the CCG will listen to the people of Will, listen to the practitioners, listen to the users, that they will change their mind at the 11th hour and turn this around. I am very proud and humbled to be asked by a personal hero of mine, Dr. Adi Mangani, to, re to move this petition. The work he's done on behalf of people of the North End of Birkenhead all his life uh, has been phenomenal. And I would just like to pay credit to him and every single faction of the, the movement that has been behind the petition, because we are more there. We are at our strongest when we all work together. So I move that petition on their behalf, Mr. Thank you, Councillor Burks. I also have a second petition. Uh, smaller in number, but equally as important to those people who have signed it. This is about the 492-495 bus route, uh, which was victim to the Avon collapse. Unfortunately, uh, some of it's been replaced, but the evening time and Sunday service no longer exists, leaving many people isolated and stranded. I presented this to the Transport Committee of the City Region, but I want to present this to our Chief Executive as well, to show the feeling of local residents Try and get something done on this matter. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor yeah. Angela Davis. Well, oh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've got a joint petition here that's been done um, between Labour and the Prenton Tenants and Residents Association. It totals 804 signatures. Um, and we are calling on Mayor to travel to work with um, residents and the bus companies to reinstate the number 83A bus service. Thank you. Thank you. So now we come to item six, public questions. <coughs> Four public questions have been received in advance of the meeting. From Ms. Lorraine Krimu to, to Councillor Bernie Mooney, Mr. Simon Gong to Councillor Stuart Whittingham, Ms. Karen O'Rourke to Councillor Anita Leach, and Mr. Jeff Roberts to Councillor Phil Bright and all have the right to ask a supplementary question. So, Ms. Krimmel, would you like to come forward to ask your question to Councillor Bernie Mooney, Cabinet Member for Children and Families? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm here to ask, with the support of a lot of other child care providers um, in Wallasey, will the Cabinet Member, Ms. Mooney, please give her full support to local child care providers in requesting World War Council to set aside the policies that will allow them to find childcare providers if they make spelling mistakes and or do not comply with administrative requirements on documents that we have to fill in for EYE funding. Councillor Bernie Mooney. Okay, firstly, um, thank you very much for your question. Um, the council is required to ensure that the public funds for services are used effectively and efficiently. So the proposal to implement a charging policy for the council to support the early years of providers seeks only to ensure the requirements are met and that it's consistent with policies that are used in all of the councils around the country. The draft charging policy was disseminated to providers of early years education and childcare. It was shared purely as a consultation proposal. Um, we have now, the providers were asked to submit feedback by the 30th of November in 2019 this year and this feedback will be collected and it will be reported to the Forum for Early Years Working Group before being presented to the Schools Forum in um, January 2019. The Schools Forum will then advise the council, so the advice will come from the Schools Forum, the advice will come from educators to um, the council. Uh, what happens, uh, but 
whatever happens, training required under the child care providers as part of the Child Care Act of 2006, Section 59, will always be provided free. So we're just, we have all the information, we're looking at all the information, we'll consider all the information, but it will go to the schools for them and we will be taking their leave, whatever they, whatever they advise us to do. So that's the situation as it stands. Can I ask a supplementary question now? Um, would you accept an invitation, because I am here representing some of the nursery owners as well, would you accept an invitation to attend a meeting mm -hmm. with nursery owners to actually explain the response tonight, because we've been told that this policy is being implemented in April. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll get back to the officers who are dealing with this and I'll see if we can set something up because I'm not sure if it would be appropriate for me to step in. But if it is appropriate, I'd be more than happy to come along. But I will make, I'll check with, the, with the, um, the officers who are responsible for this. And I, as I say, if it's appropriate, I will come along. But I'll make sure that you have some feedback to the second part of the supplementary question. Is that okay? Yes, I know. Thank you very much, Marie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I understand that Councillor Wendy Clements is on her way back to her seat, which is now wishes to declare an interest. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to declare that I'm employed at an early year setting, so I couldn't have declared that earlier because I didn't know it was a question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clements. So our second question is Mr. Gong. Please come forward to ask your question to Councillor Stuart Whittingham, Cabinet Member for Highways and Transport. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, as you are aware, Stuart, uh, this time last year I raised with you the appalling state of the street lights of Sweden also broken out countless occasions on major and minor roads and collected for years at a time. He responded by explaining that many of these faults were not being addressed. A programme of repairs and reversals took place between late 2017 and spring 2018, divided into two phases. However, most, if not all, of these focus on quite a residential street, but very few, if any, the broken lights on my list, which are brought on repeating in streets included. Until I get pressing, for them to be addressed in much of urgency. Even more inexplicably, no repairs on any of the main roads were carried out except one location, Great Lane, Common 9. The rest remain collected three years on. What is the reason why this is happening? According to Luke Rippon, in an email that last year he sent me, he stated that one of the faulty lights on Monty Road by a Seacombe Social Club was repaired, and it wasn't. Another one in this card was repaired, and it wasn't. The five bars by Social Club was had a broken light for five years, and he said a column replacement was due, that was a year ago, so far no action. So, it seems to me the lights are being reprioritised in areas where they are broken to begin with, and areas like Egremont Pool, Seacombe Discard, be brought into more, the less affluent areas with the higher crime rates, those areas seem to be routinely neglected because I've got all the photographic evidence of lots of areas where these areas have not been tackled. Where is the logic in that? And as for claiming how information is provided to residents once in a lot of the street lights in report, I've not heard a single piece of communication from you in the year since I last raised this issue at this very same meeting, despite the numerous reminder emails I've been sending everyone, including the street scene. As a result of that, I've set up a direct action group called Safe Streets Wirral with local residents, naming the Austin Road and all over this part to highlight the failure of the council to address these as a matter of priority. It's almost three years since the first brought these spots to everyone's attention. I should have to keep doing this. You aim to replace 27,000 lights by 2021. At the moment, there's a list of about 400 that have flagged up and none of them, but very few have been replaced. It's best to revise that and have something more realistic, like deal with the road first before we really tackle all the other lights. I mean, how difficult is it exactly to change a light bulb and use a cherry pick? I ask you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks for the question, Mr. Long. Uh, considerable progress has been made, and more than one million pounds has been spent on reactive repairs since September 2017. In fact, 1,000 rack columns and a similar number of new accidents have been restored across the board in that time. This is not true that the main routes have been infected at the expense of quite a bit of the road. An example of this is the LED phase one conversation two to three years ago, which specifically targeted at the distance for routes. Repairs of crowds are based on the number of outages in a certain road, uh, in a certain road, and there is insufficient funds to repair every defective street lights across the borough. Oxton Road Wallace is an example where soaking discharge items were replaced by LED lanterns. Council officers have contacted the Gong on a number of occasions 
uh, to discuss the inquiry and the matter for himself on uh, these two occasions, including one here today. You have also received a response to the latest sister faults and the lower strategies, all data information on the repairs undertaken to the report of faults, and the new faults uh, will be no doubt dealt with in the appropriate manner. All Secret Road uh, and Doxic Road have under underground cable faults, which have caused a large number of street lights to be on this. The repairs of Doxic Lights Masters will be repaired as part of the improvement scheme under the Little City Region, the improvement way to start in March 2019. Engineers look at the connection of the to light to multi bridge road, possibly in the form of over the cable, cables between cobbles. Duke Street is a Scottish Power underground cable fault. Officers have met the Scottish Power to move the repair times forward, and it's expected that these repairs will take place in January 2019. Contractors will be pricing the tender for LED phase 2 during the first few weeks of the new year, with tenders being returned before the end of January 2019. Evaluations will take place. Late January, early February, with the installation work starting late February, early March of next year. Consultants prepare the tenders for the council and indicate that two years is a reasonable contract period for this volume of work and the contract will be completed by the end of March 2021. Thank you. Mr. Gone? Yeah, uh, just a little bit. Okay, yeah, just uh, to say that the LED lights are state of the art and more efficient. I have noticed that since the 2015 programme on the main roads, which you just alluded to there, there are quite a lot of these areas where these LED lights have actually gone out inexplicably due to whatever cable fault or underground system error there may be, or the CMS control system which connects on the top using those little nodes, as uh, Sean Brady explained to me. There are, at the moment, an ever-growing list I've noticed on my scouting rounds, so you know, let it be known that I do go around every night on my bike checking these lights that aren't working, so there has to be an explanation as to why these LED lights aren't working. I wonder if there is, so is there any explanation why? Because they seem to have just been fitted and then within about 30 weeks or three or four months it gone out again. So it seems to me they're not quite as uh, reliable as they can claim to be. Councillor Whitney. Uh, the best advice for the uh, new LED units are actually no working there if uh, and to give you assurance that the uh, council officers do scouts around, especially during the winter, and uh, there's pick up faults, as well as the faults of the council as you've looked at. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms O'Rourke, please ask your question to Councillor Anita Leach, Cabinet Member for Environment. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The UN has recently said that the world triple its efforts to reduce emissions or face imminent climate catastrophe. The biggest review of the UK's climate for a decade found that our climate is already 20% wetter than even the recent past, and flooding is likely to become much more severe. The government is looking at ways that each local area can strive for greater flood resilience by better land use planning and better water storage upstream. The government has said people may have to be moved away from high-risk high flood areas as flooding becomes more likely. Therefore, I would like to ask the Cabinet Member for the Environment if, in light of all the dire warnings, do you think this is a good idea to build an energy-sapping golf resort with a massive carbon footprint <laughs> surrounded by car-dependent houses, all serviced by a pollution-increasing new road system, in the middle of the highest risk Zone 3 floodplain, which currently alleviates flood risk in Miles and Morton. Mr. Sorrell, thank you for your question. You'll be aware that we have not yet received a planning application for the Celtic Manor Resort. The planning application, when received, will include detailed technical assessments and investigations which will cover all the environmental and ecological issues that you raise. The issue of flood management and the wider environmental impact of the development will feature prominently in this work. I understand that the developer is beginning to commission these studies. When we do receive the application and it goes into the planning process, Organisations like the Environment Agency and Natural England will be statutory <coughs> consultees and will need to agree what is proposed. These organisations and others will draw upon best practice and national policy 
to arrive at a considered and balanced view based on an agreed set of data and the facts as presented. But at this stage, it is too early in the process to provide an informed decision. That judgment can only be made once the data have been collected and is available for professional scrutiny. Every new development, regardless of its size or nature, requires energy and therefore carries an associated carbon footprint. Therefore, the task of the Planning Committee is to always strike a balance between impact and the benefits arising from individual developments, responding to each application on its own merits. The planning process is the vehicle for that judgment to be made and not the cabinet member for environment. When we reach that point when the application for the council Manor development does come to planning, every rural resident should be assured that a full consultation process will take place so there will be opportunity for your views and the views of other rural residents to be heard. Ms. Rook. There is now a one in three chance of a new rainfall record somewhere in England and Wales every winter. The resort water storage areas will simply meet planning requirements to store water from a one in 100 year storm. If this is the case, the Environment Agency are unable to reject this. Three years ago, Carlisle was flooded with rainfall from a thousand year storm despite having brand new flood defences. The resort flood defences simply will not be sufficient to deal with the more frequent and intense storms that will come over the next decades. It is absolutely clear that urbanisation of floodplains leads to increased flood risk. We don't need developer studies to know that the carbon footprint, footprint of this resort is massive. If this council proceeds with the resort, then they are just paying lip service to climate change strategies. Councillor Leach concludes her amendment to the climate, change, uh, climate emergency motion later on by stating a desire for political pressure to make rapid change in a time when we need to be guided by ethics, not costs. So I would ask, is the resort being driven by ethics or by cost? And does the council place greater value on income to the council rather than the environment and the health and well-being of future generations? Obviously this council is concerned about people's well-being and that's the reason why I've said in my statement that it's important that we look at ethics and not cost. So Mr Roberts, please ask your question to Councillor Philip Brightmore, Cabinet Member for Leisure and Recreation. Mm. Councillor Brightmore, I'm a member of the Warren Golf Club, which is a long-standing tenant and occupies part of the Grange, a building on the Warren Golf Course site. In light of the council proposal to outsource the management of the Warren Golf Course, I have concerns regarding the club facilities. Can you clarify the intention of the council regarding the Grange building occupancy and use? And if the council intends to either sell or lease the building as part of the plans for the Warren Golf Course, can you provide assurances that leaseholders will be respected and full cons consultation will be undertaken with all of the current tenants? Councillor 